Good morning. What a privilege to be able to share with you again. Wonderful time ahead. And uh, I want to look at the mercies of God. I want us to discover the mercies of God. Um, what an awesome, awesome thing to ponder on and to think about and to make part of your life. But first of all, I want to lay a basis and um, I want to ask a question. What do you and I believe? Why do I ask this question? It is so important what we believe because what we believe determines our life. What we believe, we become. We act according to what we believe. You can ask a lot of people, most Christians, you ask them, do you, do you believe? They will say, yes, I believe. But deep down in their heart, it's a different story. Deep down in their heart, there's some things that they don't agree with. But the right thing to say is, I believe. And that's why it's so important to have a good look at what we believe and to test it against the finished work of the cross of Calvary and to test it against the life of Christ. If it aligns with that, then the belief is sound. If it does not align with that, then we must leave that belief, we must take it to the cross and crucify it and leave it there and not make it part of our lives. So we're going to start off by reading Proverbs 16 verse 6 out of the Amplified and it says, By mercy and love, truth and fidelity to God and man, not by sacrificial offerings, iniquity is purged out of the heart and by reverent worshipful fear of the Lord, men depart from and avoid evil. So the moment we open our hearts to the mercy, to the grace, to the love of God. Our lives is tra completely transformed. And that doesn't mean that I am perfect all of a sudden. But it means that my heart is pure before God. Matthew 21 verse 18 to 21. Let's read. In the early dawn the next morning, as he was coming back to the city, he was hungry. And as he saw one single leafy tree, um, uh, sorry, and as he saw one single leafy fig tree above the roadside, he went to it, but he found nothing but leaves on it. Seeing that in the fig tree, the fruit appears at the same time as the leaves. And he said to it, never again shall fruit grow on you. And the fig tree withered up at once. When the disciples saw it, they marveled greatly and asked, how is it that the fig tree has withered away all at once? And Jesus answered them, Truly I say to you, if you have faith, a firm, relying trust, and do not doubt, you will not only do what has been done to the fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain, be taken up and cast into the sea, it will be done. Now most of the time, we use the scripture to talk about faith. And there's nothing wrong, it's about faith. But I want us to look at something else in the scripture. I want us to look at something that's relevant to our lives. Verse 21, And Jesus answered them, Truly I say to you, if you have faith, a firm relying trust and do not doubt, you will not only do what has been done to the fig tree, but even if you say to the mount, this mountain, be taken up and cast into the sea, it will be done. I want to focus on, truly I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt. Here we see something. We see that we can have faith and doubt at the same time. Two opposite powers in our lives. To illustrate it, let's take a rope. So for instance, um, I've got a rope and I just lay it on the ground and I take one side and I pull. It's easy. It's no effort to pull on this rope. I only need a little faith. Say the power to move the rope is faith. I only need a little faith to move. But the moment I put something else on the other side of that rope, maybe a guy bigger than myself pulling on the other side of, the, of, of this rope, now it's a different story. Because 
as I pull, he pulls harder. As I pull, and uh, you see, and this is where doubt comes in. The word doubt literally means oppose. And this is a lot of times how we live our Christian lives. We pull on one side with faith and doubt is pulling on the other side. And, and we think that if we become stronger in faith, if we uh, gym more, whatever it is, it will be easier just to pull the rope. But the moment we pull harder, unbelief, unbelief pulls even harder on the other side. And so we live one day on top of the wall, the next day down in the gutter. So we see in this part of scripture that we can have faith, but at the same time, we can have contradictive thoughts. And this is the reason we live such unstable lives as Christians. If what I see in the word is in line with what I believe, then I will have a stable and victorious life. A lot of things we grew up with that is good is not necessarily in line with the life and the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. To live a stable life, we need to stand on two legs, two pillars, two truths, call it what you want. John 1 verse 18 Amplified says, No man has ever seen God at any time. The only unique Son or the only begotten God who is in the bosom in the intimate presence of the Father. He has declared Him. He has revealed Him and brought Him out where He can be seen. He has interpreted Him and He has made Him known. Why the scripture? You see, the first pillar or truth or leg we must base our belief system on is the finished or rather the life of Jesus Christ as we see it in the four Gospels. You see, uh, the scripture says nobody has ever seen the Father except Jesus. Jesus saw God for who he was. Jesus came to live God. John 14 verse 8 to 10 said, Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father. Cause us to see the Father. That is all we ask. Then we shall be satisfied. Jesus replied, I am. Have I been with all of you for so long a time and you do not recognize and know me yet, Philip? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say then, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? What I am telling you, I do not say on my own authority and of my own accord, but the Father who lives continually in me does the then in brackets, his works, his own miracles, deeds of power. You see, by the life that Jesus lived and how he treated people by touching them, how he handled them, how he ministered to them, how he showed compassion to them, he showed us who God is. And this is who, how we can see what God looks like or who God is. And that is why we need to read the Bible with the Holy Spirit guiding and teaching us and that's why we must meditate on the word to see what the life of Jesus was like. Because Jesus loved God. And then we know what the heart of the Father is. By this way, by meditating on scripture, by reading it with the with a, uh, with a revelation of the Holy Spirit, my faith can align with God's faith. And now I can live a victorious life. A lot of times we read things in the Bible and we say that we believe but we don't really believe it. We say we believe it, but the evidence is not in line with the word. For example, we believe that God heals, but deep down in our heart, I maybe think that he's angry with me. You see, this is the one is against the other. There's a pulling of opposite forces. I, I believe that he's the healer because I read it, but I believe but in my heart, there's a belief that, oh, he's an angry God. Now I've got doubt on the one side. I've got belief on the other side. And they are two opposite forces pulling. You see, I've, I must make the word part of my life. The Holy Spirit must reveal God. I must see the heart of God. And when I see the heart of God, 
I believe that his heart is for me to be healed. We keep on doing and believing the same thing and yet we expect different results. Every time we receive something, we must measure it against the life of Jesus as we find it in the Bible. And that way, we will really find out what we believe. The second leg of the second truth is the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. You see, there is nothing you and I can add or subtract. It is finished. Received written in blood. The first leg was the life of Christ as the representative of who God is. And the second is the finished work of the cross. All thoughts and truth and word and things we receive must be measured against these two truths or pillars. If it is in line with this, then it will be in line with the word and then the result will be the same as the word. And so our lives will become stable, founded on these two truths. 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 10 verse 3 to 5, Amplified says, For though we walk, live in the flesh, we are not carrying on our way of warfare according to the flesh and using mere human weapons. For the weapons of our warfare are not physical weapons of flesh and blood, but they are mighty before God for the overthrow and destruction of strongholds. Inasmuch as we refute arguments and theories and reasonings and every proud and lofty thing that sets itself up against the true knowledge of God, and we lead every thought and purpose away captive into the obedience of Christ the Messiah, the Anointed One. The scripture has nothing to do with fighting the devil. These strongholds, these plans and thoughts that is built up against the knowledge, of the true God. The fight that we fight is in our minds and our thoughts. And then our thoughts become our belief. And the way that you think about something influences the way that you act. The way that you think about something influences the way that you act. The way that you think about God, the way that you think about yourself, others, things, becomes, becomes strongholds in your life. So if I, if I think about God as an angry angry God. I read the Bible and I see that he heals. And I, I believe it, but there's doubt because how can an angry God want to heal me? So I've got this, I'm just using that as an example. There's a lot of other examples. You see, what we must do is, the scripture says, we must bring it to the obedience of Christ. In what was Christ obedient? And this is the key. Philippians 2 verse 8. And the Amplified says, And after he had appeared in human form, he abased and humbled himself still further and carried his obedience to the extreme of death, even the death of the cross. So every thought ab about who God is, who I am, who others is, who the devil is, we take to the cross. And if it is not in line with what Jesus did and finished on the cross, then I crucify it, I reject it, and I leave it be. This way, I will get rid of a lot of things that weigh me down and is of no benefit to my life. I want to close this first uh, basis uh, teaching before we go on with the mercies of God by saying, because of the way we were raised and what we were taught, we formed a certain opinion about who God is, about our lives, about Christianity, about a lot of things. Maybe you see God, like I've said, as an angry being that is ready to punish you, to make you sick so that he can teach you something or whatever. Maybe you see that. And over time we formed a lot of ideas and we believe a lot of things that is the exact opposite of what the Word really teaches. And now, the moment I must trust God for answers, I can't because deep down, I don't really believe fully. There's doubt putting on the other side. I doubt and it's a fight in my life every single day. And then when God shows me mercy, it is hard for me to understand. It's hard for me to believe it. It's hard for me to receive it. And so I rob myself of a life that is hidden in Christ. 
So I need to lay this foundation. I must, first of all, have a look at the life of Christ. See how the way he lived, how he handled people. That's the first leg that I must build my faith on. The second one is the finished work of the cross of Calvary. So any thought or belief that I have of God, I take to the cross. I see what Jesus has done. I see that God loves me. He gave his son to me. And then I crucify the fact that maybe he's an angry God because he's not an angry God. So I take it back to the cross. If he does not align with the finished work and with the life of Christ, I get rid of it. I change my belief. I change it so that it's in line with the heart of the Father through Jesus Christ. And this is the heart that he has for us. The next scripture is the scripture we are going to use in our series. I want to start by just reading it and then I'm going to leave you with this. Matthew 9 verse 9 to 13 out of the Amplified says, And Jesus passed on from there. He saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's office. And he said to him, Be my disciple, side with my party and follow me. And he rose and followed him. And as Jesus reclined at the table in the house, behold, many tax collectors. And listen to this. Especially wicked sinners came and sat, reclined with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, Why does your master eat with tax collectors and those preeminently sinful? But when Jesus heard it, he replied, Those who are strong and well, healthy, have no need of a physician. But those who are weak and sick, have a weak, but, but those who are weak and sick, sorry. But when Jesus heard it, he replied, Those who are strong and well, healthy, have no need of a physician. But those who are weak and sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, that is readiness to help those in trouble and not sacrifice as sacrificial victims. For I came not to call and invite to repentance the righteous, those who are upright and in right standing with God, but sinners, the erring ones, and all those not free from sin. Jesus tells the Pharisees that they must go and learn what it means that he desires mercy and not sacrifice. What he actually is saying to them is that they must go and find out who he is, and how he shows mercy to people. And this is the basis for our departure on this journey where we will discover God's mercies and what it entails. Remember, God loves you. He loves you. He loves you. God bless. Have an awesome, awesome time. Studying the word, reading the scriptures. And remember, if our belief does not align with the life of Jesus and the finished work of the cross, then doubt will always be part of it. So let's get rid of it in Jesus' name. Amen. And this is going to be a glory.